This video is brought to you by the brand new SteelSeries Alias and Alias Pro microphones. I just worked with SteelSeries to create an official unboxing and setup video for these, so click the link below to check it out or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, I don't want to scare anyone, but depending on when you're watching this, it's December. The year is basically done. I'm looking back on last year's New Year's resolutions being like, damn you potato chips, you ruined everything. I literally bought an aspirational pair of jeans at the end of last year. Good to know they'll do me for my 2024 aspirations as well. It's not my fault, man. Too many good video games came out this year. How the hell are we expected to get to the gym when we could be playing Baldur's Gate 3 or Resident Evil 4 or Hi-Fi Rush? Maybe some of you have the time management skills and willpower required for that. Certainly not me. This year isn't even over, by the way. Very soon we've got the Avatar game coming, as well as the day before. Gonna be very interested to see how that one shakes out. Things are slowing down for sure, but they aren't done yet, and that means we're here to cover it. Just in case you clicked on the wrong video, this is This Week in Video Games, and here comes the news. It's been a bit of a rough year for Todd. Starfield is the first new IP from Bethesda in like 25 years, and it launched triumphantly to a brilliant critical reception. It was when everybody else got their hands on the game that the wheels started falling off the old spaceship, with many expressing disappointment at Starfield's story, exploration, quality of life issues, and a general sense that this one just wasn't hitting the mark. It got so bad that the game recently fell below 50% positive reviews on Steam, though that number has rebounded recently after a Steam sale welcomed in a number of new players. Still, there remains a sense that Starfield is just a little bit disappointing, and so Bethesda have trotted out an all-new strategy to improve player sentiment, telling them that they're wrong and that Starfield is good, actually. This is real, but I struggle to believe it. It was spotted by Juicehead. They noted that Bethesda have begun responding to negative Steam reviews, and the responses are pretty good. One review complained about Starfield's famed penchant for loading screens, to which a Bethesda representative responded, quote, Consider the amount of data for the expansive gameplay that is procedurally generated to load flawlessly in under three seconds. We believe that this shortcoming will not hinder our players from getting lost in the world we've created, end quote. Uh, well, obviously it did hinder that person's enjoyment. That's why they said as much in a review. So just saying that it wouldn't doesn't change that. Another review called Starfield Story generic and its gameplay boring, to which a Bethesda representative enthusiastically responded, you can fly, you can shoot, you can mine, you can loot. Starfield is an RPG with hundreds of hours of quests to complete and characters to meet. Most quests will also vary on your character skills and decisions, massively changing the outcome of your playthrough. Try creating different characters with backgrounds and characteristics that clash or are opposite of your previous character. You'll feel like you're playing a totally different game." End quote. I don't quite know what to say to that one. My favorite though was a review that complained about all of the empty planets in Starfield. They obviously weren't fans of Bethesda's procedural generation model, but the truth is they just didn't get it. Luckily, Bethesda are here to tell them how they should feel. Quote, we are sorry that you do not like landing on different planets and are finding many of them empty. Some of Starfield's planets are meant to be empty by design, but that's not boring. When astronauts went to the moon, there was nothing there. They certainly weren't bored, end quote. Yeah, because they are on the fucking moon. It is a truly baffling set of responses from what we assume is Bethesda customer support, the team who made headlines years ago with the Fallout 76 canvas bag controversy, where they were like, yeah, there was a mix up with the bag. We aren't planning on doing anything about it. <laughs> I appreciate their love of product. It's nice to see them going into bat on Starfield's behalf, but when it comes to changing player perception, let's get a few more game patches and a little less gaslighting. Oh man, that was one hell of a story. Moving right along, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 has only just recently disappointed fans, but Activision are getting ready to disappoint fans all over again with next year's iteration. This week, Windows Central got an exclusive scoop when they reported the first details of COD 2024, which if this reporting is accurate, is going to be a Black Ops game set during the Gulf War in the early 90s. Windows Central claimed that Treyarch are leading the development of this title, and that it will again focus on the more clandestine aspects of warfare and intelligence gathering, similar to the way the Cold War came campaign did a while back, and not for nothing, but that was a pretty good campaign. I actually enjoyed that one. Given the setting and timeline, the game will apparently lean more into traditional military technology rather than the future tech we've seen in more recent releases, and apparently they're shooting for a more nuanced narrative of the Gulf War, and I'm going to be very interested to see how Activision apply their deft touch to that period of history. Outside of these things, the rumors get a little more shaky with rumors of returning maps from previous Black Ops games, as well as a rather lengthy early access period for people who pre-order or buy the deluxe 
Deluxe Edition. This stuff's all very likely to get firmed up closer to launch, but for now that Gulf War setting looks to be a lock, and if Activision can repeat some of the stuff they did with the Black Ops Cold War release, then hopefully this will get a better reception than Modern Warfare 3 did. Though to be fair, that is a very, very low bar to clear. The game currently sits at a mixed 41% on Steam and a weak 58 on Open Critic, making it one of the lowest rated COD games in history. Bobby Kotick's parting gift to Phil Spencer. All class right to the end. One game that didn't disappoint fans or critics was Alan Wake 2, but the question is how many people are playing it? Well, we don't know the answer to that definitively for a variety of reasons, but Sakana is a games industry analytics organization, and according to their measures, Alan Wake 2 did not feature in the top 150 games for October if you look at monthly active users. This data comes from Matt Piscatella, who often provides fascinating insight into this stuff. He confirmed that the game did not feature in the top 150 most played games for both PS5 or Xbox Series consoles, though he did note that the game released late in October, and with a metric like that, timing certainly matters. Having said that, there were a number of things that would have held Alan Wake 2 back from being a success. The big one is the fact that it's an Epic exclusive, and setting aside any issues you might have had with that storefront, the reality is that Epic exclusives simply don't sell as well as games that are also available on Steam, and that's just a fact. Similarly, and I think even more disappointingly, Alan Wake 2 did not get a physical release for consoles. Now, Alan Wake 2 is a proper video game made for proper nerds, like myself and probably you if you watch this channel. For many of these people, physical media matters, and I definitely heard from a bunch of people who would have loved to have purchased Alan Wake 2, but wouldn't do so because they only buy physical. Fair enough, I say. These moves seem like such a silly self-own for Epic, like, yeah, I get it, you want the Epic Game Store to turn a profit one day eventually through exclusives, but your publishing effort should surely be storefront agnostic some of the time. Alan Wake 2 is not the sort of game that is going to win you market share in the battle against Valve. It's Fortnite that's going to do that, as well as all the Fortnite creator stuff that's on the way. Just put Alan Wake out on Steam, people will buy it, and you will make more money. Same goes for the physical release. Setting aside the fact that Alan Wake 2 is the type of game that appeals to people who want to buy physical editions, it's also just a shitty trend. All digital releases make sense in the case of cash-strapped indies, but if Epic can afford to get Eminem into Fortnite, they can afford to get Alan Alan Wake 2 onto retail shelves. Sorry for ranting, but to be honest, it just gets me because Alan Wake 2 is actually an incredible video game, like a truly remarkable feat of game making, and it deserves to be selling like 20 million units. No way should we be reading a headline that says Alan Wake 2 isn't in the top 150 games of its release month. I really hope Epic do an about face on this stuff and get the game out there on more platforms and on retail shelves because Remedy did something really special here and commercial decisions shouldn't be what's holding people back from experiencing it. One final bit of Remedy news, they recently provided an update on one of their in-development projects because don't forget, Remedy have like three projects in the works at the moment. This one was codenamed Project Vanguard and it was meant to be a cooperative free-to-play game published by Tencent. So what's happening right now is that the free-to-play market is changing quite a bit and you're seeing games either get cancelled or pivot back to the premium model. Hyenas is a good example of that. Sega dumped a truckload of money into that on the assumption that it was going to be a free-to-play title, but eventually they hinted that it would likely be a premium box product. In the end, they canned it entirely. Disney's Dreamlight Valley is another example. This has been in early access for a while now and was meant to be a free-to-play game when it launches next week. Now it will be a premium title, but it will still have microtransactions, of course. It is, after all, published by Gameloft. Obviously, Remedy are taking stock of these changes because this week they announced that Vanguard is being rebooted. It will no longer be a free-to-play title and will instead be a premium title, one that, quote, will lean more into Remedy's core strengths and be built on many of the features, assets, and themes already designed for Vanguard, end quote. They'd go want to reiterate that they're looking to bring their unique touch to the cooperative multiplayer format, and I'm interested in that, though I do wonder what the final business model for this one ends up being. We won't find out for a while though, Vanguard is going back to the proof of concept stage, so don't expect to see this before like 2028, and that feels really far away, but in game dev terms it's like not even a full game dev cycle. Speaking of which, Bioware are already hyping up the next Mass Effect game, but you shouldn't be holding your breath for it. Bioware did recently put out a teaser trailer for it, which didn't reveal very much to be honest, and teaser trailers usually hint that the marketing cycle is about to kick off. 
That's unlikely to be the case if recent reporting from Jeff Grubb and Tamar Hussein is to be believed. They were speaking during Jeff's Game Mess Morning podcast, and Jeff had this to say, quote, You want some original reporting? This game is just nowhere near coming out. I was told that when they revealed Dragon Age Dreadwolf in 2018, this is similar in terms of timeline. That was announced in 2018, and we're not getting that game until maybe next year. So now do the math for that, and we're talking 2029 for Mass Effect 5, end quote. Oof. Tamor agreed, saying, quote, I've heard some things as well, and this game is so far away, it's in another galaxy right now, end quote. Clever pun aside, this is definitely disappointing news, but not altogether unsurprising. Bioware are still deep in Dragon Age Dreadwolf development, with that project being delayed internally multiple times and no release date in sight. We're guessing it's 2024, but given how tight-lipped Bioware are about it, that's far from being a sure thing. If your average AAA game takes 5 plus years to develop, then Jeff's 2029 guess doesn't sound too outlandish. I must say though, I get kind of annoyed when I see companies teasing stuff that's this far out. Todd announcing The Elder Scrolls 6 a full decade before it's likely to come out was a real low point for the industry, and it sucks to see other developers following suit. When you've got something to show, show it, but kindly refrain from hyped up logo reveals and teaser trailers because all they do is create false expectations and ultimately disappointment. Speaking of disappointment, Ubisoft. Nah, I'm just kidding. They're all right sometimes. But not today though. Did you see this bullshit with the whole in-game ads that pop up when you open the menu thing? Okay, it's not quite as bad as it sounds so long as you're willing to buy Ubisoft's explanation of it all. But I don't know, you can put me in the skeptical column for this one. So what happened is that someone was playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey and they pressed the map button to, you know, bring up the map. Instead, what they got was an ad for Assassin's Creed Mirage with Ubisoft trying to spruik a 20% discount for Black Friday. It popped up for just a moment and then disappeared to reveal the map. So at first, everyone was like, classic Ubisoft. There was like no doubt that this was what it appeared to be because it just felt like such a Ubisoft move. However, Ubisoft would later go on to clarify that this was not some new form of invasive in-game advertising, but rather a bug. According to Ubisoft, quote, Our intention was to display a promotion for Assassin's Creed Mirage as part of the franchise news in the main menu of other Assassin's Creed games. Unfortunately, this technical error caused the promotion to appear in one of our in-game menus instead. We want to ensure the best player experience possible, and these disruptive pop-ups were promptly removed once we learned of the issue. We appreciate your understanding as we investigate the cause of the issue, end quote. I'll tell you the issue. Some bean counter in corporate thought this would be a clever test case, hoping they could slip it in without anyone noticing. That is, of course, a cynical read. But I think it's important to draw a pretty clear line in the sand when it comes to this stuff. With streaming services like Netflix now selling ad-free tiers, I guarantee you that it's only a matter of time before game publishers start charging extra for ad-free versions of premium games. And when that day comes, those ads are going to look suspiciously like the one Ubisoft just flashed up here. So, you know, watch this ad space. Changing tack now, one thing I don't cover enough on this channel is regional pricing. Now, we get a pretty raw deal here in Australia with items being priced well above what Americans pay for them if you do a straight dollar to dollar conversion. But that's nothing compared to what a lot of people in more developing economies experience. For many people outside of North America, Europe and parts of the Asia Pacific, the price of gaming consoles and video games is so far beyond the realms of what is reasonable that piracy is literally the only option available to people. Most of the time, that's because when publishers discount their games with region-specific pricing, it attracts people from outside those regions who are able to buy the games at a steep discount. As a result, publishers opt to not offer regional pricing at all, which, yeah, it closes that loophole, but it also means that entire markets are unfairly frozen out. Most recently, that's affected Turkey and Argentina. Right now, their currencies are particularly volatile for a number of reasons, and as such, publishers kept having to adjust their pricing. Valve offered up a solution to this. Just price these games in US dollars in those territories instead of local currency, which would remove the volatility. Makes sense, right? Well, yeah, if your goal is to stop selling games in those regions entirely, because this change has seen the price of most games go up by either a little or a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean upwards of 4,000% increases in some rare instances. These more extreme examples are about publishers not inputting new prices, so it defaults to a direct dollar conversion. But most of the games that have been updated are now notably more expensive. A tough situation for people living in economies where the average annual income is just a few hundred US dollars a month. These changes have led some to call this the end of Steam in Turkey and Argentina, but it's really just one example of a problem that affects people the world over, and that we don't talk about enough because there isn't an easy solution. 
Hopefully Valve and publishers can figure something out over the long term. But for now, I think most people in these markets are going to have to keep selling the seven seas. Moving right along, I know we just got done reporting one drawn out corporate legal battle, that of Microsoft v everyone in their quest to acquire Activision Blizzard King. But the corporate skullduggery never stops. And this week, Epic kicked off its antitrust lawsuit against Google. It started back in 2020 when Epic started selling V-Bucks to Fortnite's Android players directly, bypassing the 30% cut that Google demands if you transact on their storefront. A very common value since it's the same used by Apple, Valve and other digital shop fronts. Google responded by delisting Fortnite from the Epic Games Store. Epic released a cringy video making out like they were revolutionaries fighting Big Brother. And hey presto, three years later, the court case begins. Substantively, this is going to be the same battle that Epic fought and lost against Apple, with Epic arguing that Google's market position gives them an unfair advantage in price setting, and as a result, the overall market is less fair and less competitive than it should be. Google's response is likely to be something along the lines of, nah ah, and if history is anything to go by, then Google will win, but will likely have to make a few concessions along the way. For us, the best we might hope for out of all of this is some juicy news crumbs falling off the table, like the fact that at one point Google and Tencent discussed teaming up with the intention of buying Epic Games. This discussion was revealed in court documents. Apparently the idea originated from Phil Harrison which is obviously why it never came to fruition and was destined to fail from the start. The idea was just the thought bubble bounced around in a few emails, but it's just one example of the sort of titillating tidbits that we're going to become privy to as these companies air their dirty laundry. I'll keep you posted on all of it. A quick lightning round to finish off. Sony are being sued for $7.9 billion. The claimants in a class action lawsuit alleging that Sony abused their market leading position to impose unfair prices on consumers. Are they talking about that $70 Last of Us Part 1 remaster? Because if they are, I think they got a case. Looking at the finer print, it appears to be centered on the fact that Sony doesn't permit third-party digital sales, so online retailers can't compete on price by selling digital editions of games for cheaper. Frankly, I hope this lawsuit makes some headway, since it'd be nice if there was more competition in the digital marketplace, but given that courts have recently upheld Apple's ability to do just this, a victory here seems very unlikely. Rocksteady have just announced an alpha test for the Suicide Squad. You can sign up over on their website for a chance to get in. It'll run from the 30th of November until the 4th of December. Rocksteady did offer an important disclaimer, quote, Please note the game is still in development and this test will only represent a smaller specific section of the campaign and will not be representative of the full final experience." End quote. Translation, the cash shop and battle pass will be disabled and we'll get to see the exorbitant prices at launch. If you looked at Robocop Rogue City and said to yourself, I'd buy that for a dollar, then you are not alone because the game has gone on to become Nacon's most successful launch ever. The game currently sits at 93% very positive on Steam and has sold over 435,000 copies. Been a big year for Nacon with their movie tie-in releases. There was Robocop and uh, what was the other one? Oh, that's right, Gollum. Hard to imagine a more stark contrast, but that's the publishing business, I guess. You win some, and you really, really, really lose some others. <laughs> The Witcher's original author, Andrzej Sapkowski, is kind of famous for being a bit of a cranky devil, and he certainly reinforced that reputation this week when he was asked if he had ever played any of the Witcher games, which were of course based on his work. He had not. Quote, Never. I have no time for this, and it's not entertainment for me. No. No. Not since they appear on the market first. I never played it. Never. And I do not intend to play it. End quote. Okay, well, it must be said that Sapkowski did sue CD Projekt Red, claiming that they underpaid him given the success of the games. So I suspect that his feelings on the matter are about more than just his interest in video games. And finally, Larian have made clear that Baldur's Gate 3 Deluxe Editions are not limited, and stock levels are just fine and dandy, meaning that you don't need to buy it from scalpers. Okay, that may be true for most people, but it's not true here in Australia because you're not shipping it to Australia, are you, Larian? For us Aussies, it's easier to get Taylor Swift tickets than it is to get a Baldur's Gate 3 Deluxe Edition. And you know why? It's because Tay-Tay cares about us. And that's why we love her so much. You be good to her, Travis. We don't need another breakup album. Thank you very much. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, circling back to City Project Red for a moment, just this week they announced the Cyberpunk 2077 Ultimate Edition. It's less impressive than it sounds. I think the word ultimate conjures up image of some expansive anthology full of unique stuff. In reality, it's just the base game in the Phantom Liberty expansion in one package. Still cool, don't get me wrong. 
but I feel like Complete Edition would have been a more appropriate label. Either way, this arrives for all current gen platforms on December 5th, and it will get a physical release in select markets. There's a new Subnautica game on the way, and it's coming fairly soon-ish. This week, publisher Crafton said that Unknown Worlds were working on the next installment in their hit underwater survival series, and that we should expect it to arrive sometime in 2025, which is not soon per se, but it's certainly before we can expect the next Elder Scrolls game or whatever. Interested to see where they go with this one because the most recent entry, Below Zero, wasn't great. I feel like it was more of a spin-off than a sequel, and it really missed the mark when it came to things like storytelling and even exploration. It was ambitious, but just not in the right ways, I don't think. Here's hoping Unknown Worlds can get the series back on track with its next release. Hey, here's something cool. Just as I'm out here complaining that we aren't getting enough RTS games, developer Petroglyph just patched Star Wars Empire at War so that it works on modern hardware. So if you haven't heard of this game, that's because it was released back in 2006. It was at a time when Star Wars games came from a variety of publishers and developers, a more civilized age, before the dark times, before the EA Empire signed a 10-year deal that turned the Star Wars games faucet hard to the left. Regardless, I'm not sure what possessed Petroglyph to drop this update, but it's super rad that they did. You can grab that right now on Steam if you're interested. Cult of the Lamb is getting a major content update next year. The developer is tight-lipped on the details, but we do know the name. It's called Sins of the Flesh. The salacious promo art features scantily clad animals with little more than leaves covering their junk. The furry community is very excited about this one. Speaking of throwbacks, Nintendo just announced that Jet Force Gemini is coming to the Nintendo Online service this December. That's pretty cool, I love that game. I mean, it never broke through the way a lot of Rare's other stuff did, but it was still cool. Interestingly, this has been put out on a special adults-only Nintendo Online app in Japan because the game has a Z rating over there, which is for 18 plus only. I have walked the aisles of a Japanese bookstore and for Jet Force Gemini to cop a restricted rating while those bookshelves are just hanging out there for all to see, there is something seriously wrong with the Japanese rating system, let me tell you. One game cancellation this week, and it was for Them's Fighting Herds, an animal-themed fighting game that's meant to be pretty good, at least mechanically speaking. On the sales front, though, it was clearly a bit of a stud. I mean, dud, leading developer Main6 to turn the project into glue. Okay, not really. The game is still playable and will get bug fixes, but ongoing development will cease, the promised single-player campaign will be scrapped, and those who kickstarted the project are likely to be eligible for some form of refund. Pour one out for the bronies. Two delay announcements this week. The first was for City Skylines 2's new content. The game dropped a little while ago, but it was slash is in a very poor technical state, leading the developer to flat out warn people about that prior to launch. They also significantly delayed the console ports from this year to sometime mid next year, no specific date. As the studio works to fix the base game, they've announced a delay for the content promised in their expansion pass, which was meant to arrive this year, but will now arrive sometime Q1 2024, with other promised content receiving a similar delay. And finally, a fairly predictable delay is Space Marine 2. So the studio is talking like it might arrive sometime this year, maybe, or perhaps early next year. But I never got that vibe. When I was playing it, it definitely had some serious performance issues that were clearly going to need a lot more work. And the marketing cycle certainly wasn't picking up speed at this point, so I very much expected a delay. Sure enough, this week the developer Saber Interactive announced that the title will now ship at the back end of next year, no specific date. As disappointing as the delay is, I'm betting big money that this one will be worth the wait. When I played that preview build, I was like, yep, these people are getting it. It was a really fantastic slice of the game that left me very hungry for more. If you want to check out that preview, I'll leave a link to it below the like button. So what came out last week? Well, like I said, basically nothing. A week quieter than a church mouse. We did get that Jurassic Park Classic Games collection, but at the time of writing, there was only like 14 reviews on Steam, so obviously that one wasn't a big seller. There was a hardware release last week, though, and it was the PlayStation Portal, the dedicated remote play handheld that's being nicknamed the Dad Station, since it'll let displaced dads keep doing their thing after the kids kick them off the TV so they can watch Coco Melon for four hours straight. So, the reception to this has been pretty positive for the most part, though it is a little complicated to talk about. So this device is made for a very specific use case, remote play and remote play only. If you are buying it for that purpose, chances are you're going to be pretty happy with it since the excellent controls, screen quality and Wi-Fi performance deliver exactly what's advertised. However, there's another category of consumer who aren't looking at what this thing is and are instead focused on what it could have been a device that might have let you cloud stream games using Sony's cloud streaming service, a device that might have supported Wi-Fi 6E for lower latency, a device with a web browser allowing you to log into public Wi-Fi networks, a device with Bluetooth audio support instead of having to buy a new set of earbuds or earphones, the list goes on. 
Bottom line though, if you have a genuine need or a desire for a premium remote play experience, then yeah, this will likely make you happy, but Sony left a lot on the table with this device, and if any of those shortcomings are important to you, then this probably isn't going to be worth the 200 US dollar asking price. Okay, so what's coming out this week? Well, those Xbox ports for June Spice Wars and Roller Drone drop today. Be sure to grab them on Game Pass if you haven't already. Wizardom arrives exclusive to the PC tomorrow. It's an Apogee game, and it has a suitably retro throwback vibe. A boomer shooter set in the Harry Potter universe. Not really, but it does have wizards and you shoot things from your hand, so that's close enough. Hexen it ain't though, since it's got more than just the color brown on display. A fairly vibrant color palette, in fact. This is an early access launch, so be sure to set your expectations at the right level. Oh, and there's a demo out right now, so you can try it before you buy. Apogee keeping the whole shareware tradition alive. Gangs of Sherwood, huh. So I hadn't heard about this one until a little while ago when I saw the team announced a last minute delay for it. I checked out some gameplay and at that point I was like, ah, yeah, I can understand why you delayed this one. It just looks kind of rough. We probably shouldn't overthink it though. It is a discount title, a simple co-op brawler set in the Robin Hood universe, albeit with a lot more magic for some reason. Might be a laugh with some mates, feels like it'll end up on a subscription service at some point. It's published by Nacon, so will it be a Robocop or will it be a Golem? We'll find out when it launches on all platforms bar the Switch on the 30th. Biomutant finally arrives on the Switch on the 30th, quaking in my boots to imagine how that runs on Switch, given how shaky it was on more modern hardware. Turok 3 Shadow of Oblivion Remastered hits all platforms on the 30th. This is the latest from Night Dive Studios, completing their Turok Trilogy remaster, with this one being their most ambitious yet. After this, they put their full weight behind the Star Wars Dark Forces remaster, due out in February next year. Back at it with another Switch port, this time for Batman Arkham Trilogy, which hits on the first. No Batman port has ever launched badly, so I have full confidence that this will be a flawless technical product. Am I remembering that correctly, PC gamers? Let me know in the comments below. Here's an interesting one. SteamWorld Build arrives on all platforms on December 1st. So the interesting thing about the SteamWorld franchise is that they never want to be constrained by genre, which is why you see SteamWorld platformers and roguelikes and card games and tons more. This new one is a city builder. It's got a really beautiful 3D cartoon aesthetic. You're building both above and below ground. It's got five maps to play on and four different difficulties. It just looks really nice and fun and as chilled out as you want it to be. Like I said, it arrives on all platforms on the first. And finally, Hawked arrives exclusive to the PC on the first. Admittedly, I'd not heard of this one, but maybe that's because it looks so much like Fortnite that I thought it was Fortnite, but it's not Fortnite, allegedly. It's its own standalone free to play game and it's an extraction shooter promising to be a more approachable spin on the genre than we've seen to this point. The only other game that's tried to do something similar to this was The Cycle, but that didn't end up going so well for them. Still, you can never really predict what's going to blow up. I mean, none of us had heard about Lethal Company until last week, when all of a sudden it was pulling peak concurrence of over 170,000 people on Steam. Extraction shooters are popular, but still niche, so maybe Hawk will break through to the casual audience in ways that Hunt or Tarkov never could. I'm interested. It's free, so I'll check it out when it arrives on PC on the first. Hey, put this on your radar. We may have all had our own views on how good Sonic Frontiers was, but one thing I think we can all agree on was it was fun to run around as Sonic. Still, I don't think it was as fun as this looks. This is Haste Broken Worlds, and it looks like one of those runner games you see on mobile, except, you know, this one actually looked good. You're running, jumping, spinning, sliding, and diving through what the developer promises is an infinite number of worlds, which I take to mean procedurally generated levels. That's not all though, it's going to have a hub area for you to meet and chat with NPCs, as well as a story to uncover about why the world is collapsing behind you at such a rapid pace. I'm a sucker for flow state games, though this one is certainly a lot faster than most of the other stuff in the genre. Still, it looks fun, and I can see myself getting a few hours of enjoyment out of this, particularly while I'm killing time on the Steam Deck. If this one piques your interest, then you can check it out over on my Steam Curator page. I've profiled it over there, along with links to all of the other Put This On Your Radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and we don't have much to report on other than a reminder that this is the last week of the month, so be sure to grab your PS Plus titles and your Prime Gaming offerings before they disappear. Rest in power, games with gold. Only new thing this week is Epic's lineup. Right now you can still grab narrative sci-fi thriller Deliver Us Mars, but later this week two new titles will be on offer. The first is Jitsu Squad, a Marvel vs. Capcom inspired co-op beat-em-up that seems to star both ukulele 
and Maximilian Dude. That's pretty cool. The other one is Mighty Fight Federation. If the last one was Marvel vs. Capcom inspired, then this one's got a hell of a lot of Power Stone energy. And it too also stars ukulele. Man, they seem to really get around, don't they? All right, time for the feel-good story for the week. This one's actually pretty good. Gamers and Doritos. It's an older meme, sir, but it checks out. For decades now, the tasty, dusty snack has been the go-to for gamers to the point where Doritos have really leaned into it. Their head of marketing had this to say recently, quote, The connection between Doritos fans and the gaming community is undeniable. Both boldly and unapologetically embrace their individual flavors, end quote. I have no idea what that means, but okay. The problem with Doritos is that while they may be enjoyable for you, they are less enjoyable for those in your party chat who have to sit there listening to you making crunching sounds for as long as it takes to get through one of those party-sized bags. Luckily, Doritos HQ are on the case and they've got a solution. Here it is. Uh, quick PSA, by the way, please do not put Doritos in your ears. That is not what they are for. But what is Doritos Silent? Well, it's a new app that you can install on your phone or your PC, and it's essentially AI noise cancelling that specializes in removing chip crunching sounds. It was developed by Brooklyn-based Smooth Technology, who had this to say, quote, Working with Doritos to create this cutting-edge technology has been an incredible journey. We all know that gamers love Doritos, but that unmistakable crunch can often disrupt those intense gaming moments. With Doritos Silent, we've worked to ensure gamers can enjoy the crunch of Doritos without disturbing their fellow players, making for a better gaming experience, end quote. He'd gone to say that the technology could handle more than just Doritos, saying that it works for other chips, incredible, crackers and even raw vegetables so there you go vegans that one's for you one less way for you to annoy us all don't worry though you've, you've still got plenty of others all right ladies and gentlemen that's the show for the week bit of housekeeping the next time you hear from me i'll be over in la for the game awards i'm there for a week where i'm meeting with some developers attending the show and recording an episode of the fps podcast extremely excited to be over there for that in the meantime austin will be holding down the fort here in particular he's going to be taking the lead on the review for the day before that actually launches next week while I'm away, and I'm going to be very interested to see how that lands. Did you enjoy the show? Question mark. If you did, then there's one quick and easy way to say thank you, and it's hitting the like button. That little thumbs up is often the difference between a video doing okay versus doing pretty good, so I always appreciate it when you choose to give it a click. Similarly, subscribe if you're keen for more, and ding the notification bell if you want to go all in. December is a big-ish month with Avatar. The day before, one or two surprises, and of course, our regular end-of-year wrap-up videos like the year in review for news as well as Game of the Year 2023. I'm super pumped for all that stuff, so I hope you'll join me. For now, a big thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. So I've been partnered with SteelSeries for a long time now. Very proud of that partnership because they truly do put out some best-in-class kit from headphones to mice to keyboards and plenty more. It's been a close partnership, actually. Last year, when they refreshed their lineup of award-winning Nova Pro wireless headsets, they asked me to do the official unboxing and setup videos that would appear on their channels. I did that, and obviously, SteelSeries were happy with the result because this year, they asked me to come back and do it all over again, only this time, it was for the all-new Alias and Alias Pro microphones. Now, these mics are a big deal because they're a brilliant all-in-one solution that lets you not only stream and record high-quality audio, but they also come with tons of advanced features that allow you to bring your live streams, your YouTube videos, or just your party chat to the next level. The Alias microphones both feature a custom one inch condenser capsule that's three times the size of standard microphone capsules to flawlessly capture your voice, while a finely tuned cardioid capsule pattern minimizes background noise with a bubble-like capture area. The Alias comes in two variants, the Alias, which feeds sounds to your PC via USB, as well as the Alias Pro, which connects via XLR and has a dedicated audio controller that not only acts as a preamp, providing four 48 volt phantom power, but it also supports dual PC setups. This is the first product of its type to support that sort of thing, allowing you to feed audio to two PCs at once if you're running a dual PC streaming setup. Whichever version of the mic you get, you're gonna be getting access to Sonar, SteelSeries' is very powerful software suite that allows you to customize this mic even further. For example, Sonar supports audio routing channels, meaning you can send your voice audio to 
one channel, your game audio to another, your music to another, and your system sounds somewhere else again. This allows you to independently control the volume of each and determine which ones get streamed or recorded. I use this feature all the time when I'm recording gameplay, but I don't want Discord chatter to get picked up. Sonar also supports advanced audio features like a compressor, a noise gate, and AI noise cancelling, which means the background noise is filtered out and only your voice is captured. Sure, that means things like keyboard clicks and background chatter, but it could also mean other things. There are jets flying around me, and I can, it's not like I can hear the AI noise cancellation, I just know that it works. Taking a step back, what a package like the Alias Pro gives you is a studio quality mic with a stand and a shock absorber, a powered preamp, and a very flexible and powerful software suite that will allow you to customize both your setup and your sound quality. I really encourage you to go and look at how much it would cost you to get all those things separately, and what you'll find is that the Alias Pro is extremely competitively priced, especially for the quality that you're getting. There's so much more packed into each Alias microphone, too much to cover here in fact, so if you're interested to learn more about it, then be sure to check that setup video that I put together. I'll leave a link to that below, and if you want to grab one for yourself, then head over to SteelSeries.com and use offer code skill up at checkout you'll get a full 12 percent off your purchase no strings attached that works for any product on the steel series store by the way from headphones to keyboards and mice and more that's steelseries.com and use offer code skill up for 12 percent off your purchase thanks steel series for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it